To all who are weary and need rest, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who despair and wonder if God cares, and to all who sin and need a Savior, now, this church opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ. He is the ally of his enemies, the defender of the guilty, the justifier of the inexcusable, and the friend of sinners. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you are here on this uh, beautiful, almost balmy Sunday morning in December, the second day of Advent. If you are a guest with us, we uh, hope that you are welcomed warmly already and hope that after the service you stay around for some refreshments and we have an opportunity to get to know you. Uh, if this is your first time here and you've never signed a guest registration card, in the pew rack in front of you, there is a little card that says welcome on it, and if you would fill that out, and then later on in the service when the offering baskets come by, you can uh, put that in there, and we look forward to getting to know you. Uh, today is our second Sunday of Advent, uh, the celebration that marks the beginning of the church's year, where we are anticipating, we are waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. May the grace and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us welcome one another to worship. All who come from near and far, come and worship. All who thirst for God, come and worship. All whose hearts overflow with gratitude and hope, come and worship. All whose hearts may be filled with despair or grief, come and worship. All who come with doubts or question about life in Jesus, come and worship. To the grace of God's Holy Spirit, come worship Christ, the newborn King.
darkness, we humbly ask you, O Lord, and by your great mercy, defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus our Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let us pray. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you came among us as light shining in the darkness. We confess we have not welcomed your light 
or trusting in your good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to your presence. We have expected little and hoped for even less. Forgive our doubts and renew our faith so we may receive the fullness of your grace. Live in the truth of Jesus Christ our Lord and experience the power of the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name. Rejoice. Jesus Christ, light in the darkness, forgives you and redeems you. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness but instead expose them, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Today we light the second Advent candle, the candle of light. Your steadfast love, O Lord, 
extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see our light. Our partners, and now we send our children out with this prayer of blessing. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the strength of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? We pray for our children born in an anxious generation, that they will be of good courage. We pray their heart's desire will be to seek after you, to love your word, to love people, and to bear witness to the light all their lives. Amen. that you have a physical copy of the Bible with you. Maybe you brought your own. Uh, if not, there is one in the pew rack in front of you. Would you take it out? And let us pray. Blessed Lord, who has caused all these holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and the comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. During Advent and Christmas, we will be reading the prologue. And today, just like last week, I will read verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. But the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, 
but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. In order to understand what we have just read, come with me to Genesis chapter 1 you turn there in your Bibles. I need to give you a little prologue. Let's read the story of the creation of the world, the cosmos, in Genesis chapter 1, on the very first page of the Bible. Uh, Last week you saw that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not only existed before the creation of the world, before all of this happened, but he himself is the creator of the world. He made this happen. He set this world in motion. But I want to show you something else. You see this starting in verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, look in the text there. Notice something. What is the first thing God does? The first thing God does is a command. Let there be light. And then we read the very matter-of-fact statement of what occurred as a result of God speaking. There was light. We have no further details. There is no indication as to what this light is, how it shines, how it works. We do not even know exactly what the source of light is. Just this. There was light, and this is the news report on the first day. Now, this act of illumination is followed, if you look in the text in the next verse, by the creation of the waters. It's the second day. And then on the third day, the sprouting vegetation, plants and seedlings and trees. And then look with me in verse 14. And and God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Now, now this is interesting. On the first day, God said, let there be light. And there was light. There was night and day. So the first day, God is illuminating the entire world. But the lights have not yet been created. The sun, the moon, and the stars have not yet been made. Look in verse 14. The lights in the expanse of the heavens, this is what separates day and night. And then in verse 16, God makes the two great lights. This is an old Hebrew way of understanding the way the cosmos world works. 
the great light, the sun, the lesser light, the moon, and then the stars. So, so I wonder with you this morning, if the sun, the moon, and the stars don't get created until day four of the creation of the world, what exactly is the source of light on day one, two, and three? You tell me. What illumines the world on the first day? What is the light shining in the world on day two and day three if the sun has not yet been created? Who or what is separating the night from the dark without the greater light and without the lesser light having been created? It's, it's not the sun, it's not the moon, because they are not around until day four. But somehow there is light in this world. So, so what is it? What is the source of light in the beginning of creation? Now, now go with me to the very last book of the Bible. Book of Revelation. See, I'm making it easy for you. You're not having to look for Hezekiah. Go to the 21st chapter of the last book, also written by John, the same author as the Gospel. And this is the account of Creation 2.0, the story of the new heavens and the new earth. We're in chapter 21 of John's Revelation. And I want you to look at verse 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. So this is the heavenly city, the new creation. And notice, there is no sun in heaven. There is no moon. The source of light in the new heavens and the new earth is God himself. The, gl the glory of God, the shining brightness of God, the, the brilliance of the luminescence of God's holy perfections gives light to the entire city. And there will be no night there. Now if you look ahead at the next chapter, John repeats this in verse 5 of chapter 22. And there will be no night. They need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Now that you've read the way the Bible begins and the way it ends, now we can turn to what John says about Jesus in the prologue in the Gospel of John. So turn there with me. John chapter 1. Look at verse 4. Now it all makes sense. In him, in Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, was life, and the life was the light of all people. And then look at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Now the prologue introduces a new character here, a man named John, John the Baptist, not to be confused with the author, John the Evangelist, or John who wrote the Apocalypse. It says, John is a witness to the light. He is not himself the light, which means that John did not exist before the creation of the world. John is not responsible for the creation of the world in any way. John is like a best man to a groom. John focuses all attention on him, the light. And then look in verse 7. There again you see, like we saw last week in chapter 20, the purpose for the writing of this entire gospel. Verse 7. He came as a witness to testify to the light 
so that all might believe through him. Well, that's the purpose, that people might see the light, that they would believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, have life in Jesus. Now, if you, if you look a little further in the text, notice this very strange introduction of John. Uh, this happens actually right after the text that we had just read, starting in verse 19. Now, normally, when, when I meet somebody, here is how a, an introductory interaction might work. I say, hi, my name is Tim. What's your name? How do you do? Where are you from? The person tells me where they're from. What do you do for a living? They answer the question. Uh, do you have any family? That's a normal interaction. Now, look at this interaction. The Pharisees have sent out a delegation to find out who this guy is who's baptizing all these people. And look in verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. <laughs> they asked, who are you? He says, well, I'm not Christ. And then they asked, well, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he says, no. Well, then they said to him, who are you? What a, what a weird first meeting. Are you the Messiah? I'm not. Are you the prophet? No. Are you, are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Well, can you give us something? We have to report back to our superiors. Can you give us an idea as to who we're dealing with? We will have to give a report, and a, an accounting of who we've met. And look at verse 25. They asked him, well, why are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered this, I baptize with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me, and I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. And then in verse 30, he announces what he's come to do. Look at it. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then this phrase. And I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. This is Him. This is the one. This is the light. Can we go on one more excursion? Uh, this will bring this all together. Look at John chapter 7 and 8. If you turn there, you see this is where we read about the Jews celebrating the Feast of Booths. Now, the Feast of Booths was appointed by God so that Israelites would remember their journey in the wilderness from Egypt to Canaan when they lived in booths. Now listen carefully. One of the great traditions of the Feast of Booths was a a temple lighting ceremony in which four giant golden candlesticks 70 feet high up in the air were lit in the temple courtyard by the priests. So four massive pillars of light. Now the, the light was so great and so bright that, and I, I quote, they said, there was no courtyard in Jerusalem that was not lit up by the light. So they had this big celebration. There's thousands, tens of thousands of people, these four big pillars of light, and there is not a courtyard in the entire city that was not lit up by the light. Now, they would light these lamps to remember the words of the prophet Isaiah, who in chapter 9 says, you know those Advent words well. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. 
They would remember on that day when they were lighting these four giant towers of light that the Messiah would one day come and he would be the light of the world. They're waiting for the Messiah, a light for the nations to open the eyes of the blind and to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. That's what they were anticipating. That was their prologue. They were waiting. They were wondering. They were watching to see from whence the light would come. So, so, the, so the lighting ceremony for the Feast of Booth was a prologue, an anticipation of the coming of the Messiah, the long-awaited one. Now skip ahead to the next chapter, chapter 8, verse 12, and guess what Jesus says? John chapter 8, verse 12. They have just seen the great lights. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see that Jesus says, I am the one. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I have been the one you've been watching for. And he repeats it again later on in chapter 12. I have come into the world as the light of the world so that whoever believes in me would not remain in darkness. Jesus is announcing to everyone who has just celebrated the festival, to all who have seen the entire city lit up with the great lights, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the Messiah. I am the one who was to come. I am the one who lit up the entire creation before the sun, the moon, and the stars had been made. And I am the one who will be the light in the new creation. I am the one. Look no further. I am he. Now, there's, there's one problem. Uh, go, go back to the, the prologue. Go back to chapter 1, and you'll, you'll see the problem. There's a problem in verse 10. He, the light, was in the world, and the world came into being through him that the world did not know him. So, so Jesus makes... The world, he creates the cosmos, but the, the very world that he has crafted and designed does not want to receive him. It does not recognize him as the savior that he has come to be. And then specifically talking about how his own Jewish people were going to receive him. Look in verse 11. He came to that which was his own, and his own people did not accept him. His own people, his own tribe, his own flesh and blood rejected him. They did not accept him. What an irony and what a tragedy. Jesus has come into the world, the very world that he has made. The world is dark and the eyes of men and women and boys and girls are darkened. The eyes of the hearts are blinded because rather than welcoming the light of the world, the light of the new creation, and rather than being relieved that the light has come, they prefer the darkness. They walk in darkness. They love the darkness and not the light. The, the other day I was thinking about how turbulent the 1960s would have been. I was not around Many of you were around. Uh, you may remember. Uh, some of you were in the prime of your life back then. That's 60 years ago. Um, but think about how much turbulence there was. The civil rights movement with its protests and marches, with its conflicts about segregation and discrimination, the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1963, and the assassination of Malcolm X in 1965. And then there was the involvement of the United States in the Vietnam War, the countercultural revolution, the sexual revolution, the alternative lifestyles that came with it. Then there was the political turmoil, the assassination of JFK in 63 and Robert F. Kennedy in 68. Uh, turbulent times. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh, you may remember it well. And when we look at that, you know, retrospect some 60 years ago, we often think that we're going to learn from our mistakes, that we're going to do better. We will make sure that never happens again, not on our watch, never again. We keep trying. We say, just, uh, just give us some time. 
And some people might say, well, we had a political problem and we are looking now for political solutions. Other people might say, no, it was primarily an educational problem and people need to be better educated and so they offer an educational solution. Others yet say, well, we need to keep making progress and that progress is going to come by having new laws. We need new legislation. And then, you know, we try it all. Others yet say it's primarily a financial problem, an economical one. You need to fix where the money goes to come with the financial solution. And then it will all be different. All well intended, all done with human agency and hopes and dreams for human progress. And this is why to this day we still talk about making a difference in the world and trying to make the world a better place and changing the world. This is still the way we talk. We want to make progress. We want to do better. We want to be better. But I, I can't help but wonder, here we are in 2024. How are we doing? How are we doing? How are we doing? How's that project of progress going for us? We're watching the darkness and mayhem, the bloodshed of war between Russia and Ukraine every day. Some fear the escalation of another of a nuclear war. We, we, there's another war in the Middle East with daily stories about death and darkness in Gaza and Lebanon and Israel. And we've seen two attempted assassinations of a political leader. We saw an assassination captured on camera this week of a CEO of a healthcare company. How are we doing? Our country is in turmoil over all kinds of political things. We're in turmoil over a sexual revolution happening. We're in turmoil over illegal immigration and so on, the cost of living and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And I know we'd rather not talk about these things because you're already inundated with the relentless news cycle. We were, we're in this never-ending immersion of stories of, of, how, of how dark this world can be. But this is where Advent begins. Advent begins in the dark. Advent begins by a ruthless, courageous look at the hardest, most difficult, most tragic, most gruesome events that are happening in our world. Because it is because of those, and it is because in this world that the Messiah has come. He has come as a light in this world, and he's come into this darkness. That's who he's come. Now he, let us be clear, he is the spiritual solution to a spiritual problem. And you see here that there's no amount of education, political initiative, financial incentive, educational advance, or technological education, or innovation, no matter how helpful, no matter how ingenious, that is not the Bible's solution. No, we see here we cannot save ourselves. We cannot save this world. We cannot change this world. We cannot, we will not, but he has and he will. He must do it. Look at the solution the scriptures offer in verse 12. What glorious news to all who received him. To all who believe in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Jesus Christ is the one who is going to change the world, or maybe that's not even the, the right phrase to use. We keep using that. But what he is after is so much more. He doesn't just come to change the world. He comes to save the world. He comes to, to, to resurrect the world. He's the one who offers not a pedagogical or an economical or legislative or a political solution. He comes to redeem the world through his life. And you see here, it all begins when people begin to put their trust in him, to believe in him as Savior. And somehow, this is the mystery we sung about, somehow by believing, we're not quite sure how it works, we have life in his name. The spiritual problems of this world require 
spiritual solution. The problem of sin needs a savior. The problem of evil needs a redeemer. The problem of death needs a resurrection from the Son of God. Notice in verse 13 where John locates the solution to our problems. Children now born by faith who were born not of the blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Salvation does not come from within. Salvation does not come through a bloodline. The new birth does not come through the Jews alone by being part of the tribe of Abraham. No, the, the new life in Christ does not come as the result of a human will, human intention, a human initiative, human decision-making, human willpower. The world is changed or saved rather, resurrected rather, through the supernatural intervention of God in this world. Yesterday morning at 6.15 in my uh, hometown, actually not very far from where I grew up in The Hague, uh, there was a massive explosion uh, in the middle of a residential neighborhood. Something exploded and obliterated five homes, leveling them completely. Uh, the, the cause of the explosion is as of yet unknown. We don't know if there was a stash of illegal fireworks. It's a pretty plausible explanation this time of year. Or if it was a drug lab that exploded. We don't know if this was an accident or if this was a crime or, or if this was uh, an accident in a place where crimes were being committed. We don't really know. But no matter how you cut it, it's, it's darkness and it, there's, there's death. As the ambulance and firefighters uh, came on site looking for and treating a few survivors and then locating the, the bodies of the deceased, there was also a neighborhood task force that got involved. And they're there to help the residents of the 40 homes right around in the vicinity that had to be evacuated, folks now on the streets in their PJs, many of them without shoes. Again, it happened at 6.15 in the morning. And this, this neighborhood task force, this neighborhood watch group, was doing all that they could to help these people who had now been displaced. They were bringing food and clothing and doing what they could uh, to coordinate donations. And I noticed that on the uniform of, of one of the men who was reporting on the the money that they were raising and the clothes that they were gathering and how they were helping some of these residents get their pets out of their homes. The, the name, uh, the little tag on his uniform said Lichtpunten, and that's Dutch for points of light. Points of light. That was the, the name of the organization, Lichtpunten, points of light. And it makes so much sense. Every act of kindness was a, was a point of light. Every meal served a point of light. Every overcoat donated a, a, a point of light. And th this morning, as you, as you leave this morning, I, I, I am praying that there will be two takeaways. That if you, if you receive Jesus if you accept him, if you believe in him, if you receive him as your Lord, as your Savior, and have life in his name, that you will realize how he has come to lighten your darkness, how he has come to relieve your grief, how he has come to assure you, even now, of your resurrection from the dead, and that you will be part of the new creation, and that there will be no more night. This is, this is your inheritance. This is yours by faith. And, and now secondly, I hope that you see that your calling is similar to that of John. You, like John, now come bearing witness to the light. You are not the light, but you come bearing witness to the light, and every single one of you will be a point of light. And so this week, every word you speak, a point of light. Every act of service, a point of light. Every prayer you pray for someone around you, a point of light. Every word of encouragement, a point of light. Every card you write to a shut-in, a point of light. 
Every time you sit down with someone to read the scriptures who has never read it before, a point of light. And may it be that in every courtyard, in every neighborhood, in every subdivision of this blessed city, people will see the light. People will see that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. May God lighten our darkness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this incredible news. Who could have ever thought that you from the before the foundation of the world was going to send your son Jesus so that we might have life through his death, through his suffering, and through his resurrection. Lord, we put now our faith and trust in you, and we pray that we too, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may be points of light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we come before you in the season of Advent, a season of waiting and expectation, as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of this world, we thank you for the gift of your word, which reminds us that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Lord, as we reflect on the message today, we are reminded of the calling you have placed on us just as you placed on John the Baptist, to bear witness to the light. Help us to be faithful witnesses, shining your love, truth, and grace into the dark places of this world. Illuminate our lives with your presence so that we might reflect your glory in all that we do. 
We lift up the needs of our congregation to you, Lord. We pray for those who are struggling in mind, body, or spirit, for those battling illness, facing uncertainty, or carrying heavy burdens. Bring your healing, comfort, and peace. For those grieving loss, surround them with your unfailing love and the hope of resurrection. For those facing loneliness or doubt, remind them that you are Emmanuel, God with us, and that they are never alone. We also bring before you those who we know need your light in a special way today, whether spoken aloud or held silently in our hearts, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for the ways you are at work in this church, in our community, and around the world. Empower us to carry the light of Christ in our neighborhoods and workplaces, to serve others with humility, and to proclaim the good news of great joy for all the people. May our lives be a reflection of the hope, peace, joy, and love that we find in you. As we continue in worship, prepare our hearts to receive your word today. Stir in us a deep longing for the light of Christ to transform our lives so that we may live as children of the light and share that light with a world in desperate need of your truth and grace. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, who lives and reigns with you and in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
go before you to lead you. God, go behind you to protect you. God, go beneath you to sustain you. And God, go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. But may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you always. Do not be afraid, but go in peace. Amen. Thank you.